and now we're going to move into a more mechanistic discussion of cognitive impairments and you know, across brain cancers. And so we'll be hearing from some translational work with doctors Jumper, Dr. Jumper's lab and Dr. Manji's lab, and then some clinical contacts from Dr. Dietrich. So I'd first like to introduce Dr. Sean Hervey Jumper, who's one of the co-chairs for this symposium, of course. He's an associate professor of neurological surgery at UCSF, and his lab focuses on mechanisms of interaction between gliomas and functional cognitive networks. And we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Jumper himself, as well as one of the postdocs in his lab, um, Dr. Saritha Krishna. So thank you very much. We're, we're really charged here with spending the next few minutes talking about the influence of gliomas on network dynamics. And we're going to try to do this a couple of different ways. We'll talk about network level processing. We'll also try to delve into a little bit of cell specific um, interactions and how that may influence networks. Again, my name is Sean Herbie Jumper. I'm a neurosurgeon here at UCSF. My clinical practice is really focused on treating patients with brain tumors within intrinsic brain tumors within areas of the brain responsible for language, motor, and cognition. So in my lab, we study the mechanisms by which gliomas um, and some brain metastasis interface with neural networks um, and how the, this interaction may impact network recovery and ultimately cognitive processing. Next slide, please. We don't really have an imaging specific talk here, so I wanted to just highlight a little bit of uh, brain tumor imaging. So, for many years, the brain, has been, brain and its you know, one trillion networks has been imaged. Um, and you can see uh, there, there have been just a ton of imaging modalities, each with certain strengths and weaknesses um, that really try to capture certain physiological and psychological states in humans. And, you know, whether you're answering questions about whole brain network dynamics or single neuron interactions or single synapse connections. Each imaging technique, again, has both pluses and minuses, pros and cons, based on resolution, um, as you can see here, based on acquisition time, and whether they're offering causal or correlative information. And so for the next few minutes here, we'll really focus on two imaging modalities that we've used, predominantly magnetic encephalography, as well as electrophotography. <laughs> and ability to uh, answer questions uh, using these techniques. Next slide, please. So one of the things we'll try to convince you of is that brain tumors, intrinsic brain tumors particularly, are not purely lesions, brain lesions. Um, there's a chronicity to them. And um, this chronicity results in at least some level of, of network level mechanistic changes um, that imp impact um, outcome. So if you can see here that this is, this is a similar sort of projection that has been shown by Dufault and Klein, and you can see over time, longitudinally, um, outcomes change. If you just look at language processing here, for example. So when we use purely voxel lesion mapping studies such as this to try to answer questions, it gets at part of the question. It gives us a partial answer, but we miss some elements uh, of the chronicity of the disease and how this chronicity impacts outcome. Next slide, please, Saritha. And this fact probably explains the fact that even with genetically identical or very similar tumors in nearly identical locations in the brain, we can have very different cognitive outcomes or trajectories of symptoms. You can see here for uh, language processing over the first six months of diagnosis for four individual patients, you can see some with a phenotype that shows stability of disease, um, transient decline, progressive improvement, or the progressive decline and these phenotypes do not always really mirror the trajectory of the clinical disease, meaning the glioma itself. Next slide, please. So in, in my lab, we've had a number of um, techniques and tools that we've used uh, to try to understand this uh, you know, and dive into these questions. And it really uses, we really use a combination of glioma-related imaging um, combined with tumor biology. Uh, in a series of steps, again, beginning with cognition and cognitive processing, and then trying to go down to the uh, neuron to glioma and um, glial glial interactions as well. Some genomic analysis, animal studies using calcium imaging and patient derived xenograft model. And really, the, the heart of the lab is a lot of network dynamics um, using predominantly electrocorticography. Next slide, please. So, recently, um, we were able to establish in collaboration with Michelle Manje, who you'll see, I think she speaks next, um, that when we have an opportunity to study even resting state neurophysiology, 
within glioma infiltrated areas of brain, passively recorded during surgery. Um, again, these are uh, brain tumors projecting to the cortical surface. You can find areas uh, in which there is increased network, uh, I'm sorry, increased neuronal activity as measured by high gamma band power within the 70 to 120 hertz re region. Um, and these areas of uh, within tumor infiltrated regions have increased neuronal activity in comparison to healthy brain or non tumor infiltrated regions as determined by imaging. And so, uh, next slide, please. But we can move beyond the, the um, resting state data and into task based data um, and gives us an opportunity to expand past our resting state understanding of neurophysiology for human for the human brain in the setting of gliomas. Um, and we can look at individual recordings, again, uh, predominantly focusing on an individual task, a well-defined neurophysiology task. So, for example, we use um, uh, speech initiation as one example of these sort of tasks. So here you see a series of patients. The black dots represent tumor infiltrated regions. The white dots represent non-tumor infiltrated regions on a cortically projected uh, glioma. And in the study, you can see across individual subjects uh, that where tumors are focused within the dominant hemisphere frontal lobe. And next slide, please. And we can then uh, look at individual electrodes and determine whether our task-based physiology fits with what we know about normal physiology. So for example, most of these studies come from the epilepsy population and that's really defined our understanding of language processing. You can see the very characteristic um, uh, physio physiological response with speech initiation. That is that a population of cells within the speech initiation area, used to be called Broca's area, not so much anymore, but the speech initiation population of neurons in the prefrontal cortex fires um, or has increased activity prior to 0, 0.0, which is that middle hash mark, which is when your lips begin to move. And that's classic physiology. But even when you look at individual electrodes on the screen left um, that are within tumor infiltrated areas or individual electrodes screen right with non-tumor infiltrated areas you can, uh, and, and um, uh, motor cortex, you can see that the, the physiology still stands. But um, next slide, please. And then what happens if we average over each of these electrodes both within the tumor infiltrated and non-tumor infiltrated areas. And you get a glimpse of what's happening in different regions of the network. So now you're looking at a cross-subject analysis for, for non-tumor infiltrated areas in glioma patients. And again, the uh, brain on the left shows you your grid coverage, brain on the right shows you your high gamma band power. And you can see the uh, uh, reddish orange, burnt orange color in the premotor speech area as you would expect for normal speech activation, just like normal physiology. So this is great. We've kind of re-shown in a different disease model what we've known about language processing and epilepsy. But let's move beyond that and actually look at what's happening in the tumor infiltrated regions. Next slide, please. And so if we then focus on our tumor infiltrated regions, you can see here that not only do we have the no mirroring of normal physiology, um, but you can see when we look at our FDR corrected gamma band power plots, you can see this abundance of intratumoral activation during speech onset. Next slide, please. And we can plot that speech initiation neuronal activation um, within intratumoral regions across time periods. You can see we can start at 1,000 milliseconds prior to speech onset. Speak point zero is when the individual starts to speak and the lips begin to move and you see predominantly motor cortex activation. Um, and then uh, 200 milliseconds after speech onset, you see the suppression of activity, again, as you normally would um, in non-tumor infiltrated regions or normal healthy populations. And so you can really illustrate um, using electrophysiology that speech initiation recruits what we call this tumor language network activity. Um, in a very characteristic way using this defined physiologic uh, response. Next slide, please. And so this, this nuanced understanding here makes us rethink our understanding of classic 
neurophysiology uh, with respect to chronic illnesses such as gliomas. So for example, um, we've, there, there've been many people, probably many speakers and in the audience that have contributed to this body of literature that use a localization approach to understand um, uh, lexical retrieval, lexical semantic reading, Exner's writing re region, all of these regional, regionally classified and defined regions of neuro, uh, cortical areas and, uh, based on neurophysiology. But in the setting of a chronic disease such as gliomas or even a more acute such a high has a high grade glioma you can see tumor language network activity that really is important as we think about um, uh, treating our patients and what this means for treat for uh, therapies in the future next slide please but even moving beyond that we can see here that if you then pair each of your individual electrodes to a pair match to, for, uh, by, by that I mean each cortical represented area is matched for a tumor and a non-tumor area are matched together, you can see that if you then look across your time series that you can not only see a mimicking of normal physiology, but you see it in a hyper-excitable task-based manner. Um, and the, we've estimated that for, again, for speech initiation, you actually see a task-relevant hyper-excitability within tumor infiltrated regions that's in the order of roughly 16% increase in comparison to the non-infiltrated areas of cortex. So speech initiation uh, really in induces this task-relevant hyperexcitability in tumor-infiltrated regions of brain. Next slide. So the bigger question here as we delve deeper into the lab is in, in, our, in the lab is why. And I'm going to hand it over to Sarita to just scratch the surface for the next couple of minutes about some of our thoughts for on how this may be happening. Thanks, Sean. Um, hi, everyone. So let me start off with this image of nervous system cancer crosstalk. Um, the concept of neural regulation of brain tumor microenvironment and the idea that uh, brain tumor cells can reciprocally influence um, neuronal activity is becoming more mainstream. Based on um, several papers published over the last couple of years, we now know that nervous system cancer crosstalk is actually bidirectional. And there is this vicious malignant cycle going on between neurons and glioma cells, where increased neuronal activity promotes glioma progression and vice versa through uh, different mechanisms. However, majority of the research work uh, which investigated or focused on glioma neuronal interactions primarily used uh, preclinical models, animal models. And we believe there are still um, several data gaps that need to be addressed. First, uh, we need to know the localization of the synaptogenic glioma cells, meaning where exactly are these glioma neuron interactions happening in the tumor microenvironment? Uh, second, uh, what are the cellular mechanisms underlying functional network integration of tumor? Uh, third, and more importantly, what is the biological relevance of glioma neuron interactions in humans? Is this interaction of any uh, cognitive or survival significance to the patient? So this is our study workflow. Uh, for the cognitive assessment, uh, patients underwent baseline language variation one day prior to tumor resection. Patients were administered multiple language tasks such as text reading, four syllable repetition, picture naming, auditory naming, etc., to identify any deficits in their specific language domains. Following um, cognitive evaluation, we did uh, magnetoencephalography, MEG, uh, to measure long-range brain functional connectivity. Uh, with MEG, then we sampled intratumoral regions based on either the presence of elevated or high functional connectivity, which we have denoted as HFC, and those regions with suppressed or low functional connectivity, which we have denoted as uh, LFC. We then use this uh, site-directed tissue samples from high and low connectivity regions to perform further experiments like RNA sequencing, in vitro co-culture, patient-derived xenograph model, etc. Now, moving on to the results, um, uh, RNA transcriptomic assessment of primary tumor samples from both high and low connectivity regions um, revealed a differential expression of many genes involved in neurogenesis, inflammation, proliferation, etc. Out of the several upregulated um, neurogenic genes in our high functional connectivity regions, we focused our attention on thrombospondin 1, TSP1, because it's already a well known synaptogenic factor implicated in astrocyte to neuron interaction. Uh, we then proceeded uh, to determine the expression of TSP1 from our combined high and low functional connectivity populations. And what we have is a 
uh, feature plot uh, that shows TS TSP1 expression from different types of cells, including tumor cells and the normal non-tumor astrocytes. Uh, we then generated a dot plot to find the actual percentage of TSP1 positive cells in our astrocytic as well as tumor cell population within high and low functional connectivity samples. So as you see here, within low functional connectivity samples, TSP1 expression is primarily confined to the normal non-tumor astrocytes, whereas in high functional connectivity samples, TSP1 expression is primarily from tumor cells. So this uh, data suggests that within low connectivity samples, it's the normal non-tumor astrocytes that secrete thrombospondin 1 uh, to generate functional connectivity, which actually mirrors normal neuronal physiology. Whereas within high functional connectivity samples, it is the tumor cells that take over this role to secrete thrombospondin 1 and generate functional connectivity. Uh, we then uh, confirmed this elevated TSP1 profile of our high con functional connectivity samples uh, by immunohistochemistry. Uh, we also measured TSP1 in the serum of glioma patients and found a strong positive correlation between the number of intratumoral high functional connectivity MEG voxels and circulating thrombospondin 1. So collectively, uh, this data demonstrates a tight, strong relationship between uh, the synaptogenic factor thrombospondin 1 and intratumoral high connectivity regions. Uh, next, we wanted to see this elevated TSP1 profile of high connectivity regions. Does this have any impact on synaptogenesis? Uh, for this, uh, we characterized a pre and post synaptic marker expression uh, in our primary tumor samples from both high and low connectivity re regions. Uh, so, what we have here in red is synapsin 1, which is a pre synaptic uh, marker, nestin to label uh, tumor cells and we use neurofilament to mark our neurons. As you can see, uh, compared to low functional connectivity, primary patient samples from high connectivity regions, they showed a significant increase in synapsin 1 functor density. And similar was the case with the postsynaptic side. We used PSD95 as a postsynaptic marker. As you can see here, compared to LFC, primary patient samples from high connectivity regions, they showed a significant increase in PSD95 postsynaptic functor density. Uh, moving beyond from what a uh, tissue looks like, we did um, in vitro experiments where we co-cultured glioma cells from high and low connectivity regions with neurons using two different models. So one is a 2D system uh, where we co-cultured um, glioma cells from high and low connectivity regions with uh, mouse hip uh, hippocampal neurons and then look for postsynaptic marker expression. So what we have here in red is HOMER1, which is a postsynaptic marker. Nestin to label uh, tumor cells, which is pseudo colored as white in this image, and neurofilament to label mouse hippocampal neurons. Uh, as you can see here, compared to low functional connectivity cells, there was a significant increase in HOMER1 postsynaptic uh, functor in our high functional connectivity cells. So, taken together, this data shows uh, the presence of an enriched population of synaptogenic glioma cells within high functional connectivity network hubs. So for the second model, uh, we used a 3D approach where we co-cultured glioma cells from high and low connectivity regions with uh, neuron organoids. So what we have here in green are induced neuron organoids, and in red are RFP labeled um, high and low functional connectivity glioma cells. We then uh, live imaged these cells after 12 hours of co-culture and found this um, interesting phenotype. I hope everyone can see this video. Um, we found that this um, HFC cells I'm sorry. Yeah, HFC cells, they are diving into this uh, organoid ball and they are making these uh, food like processes to co localize with the functioning neurons. Whereas um, LFC cells, on the other hand, um, they, they still remain at the periphery. They seem to care less about neurons. So, this uh, data suggests an integrative phenotype of high functional connectivity regions. And we wanted to know if this phenotype is driven by thrombospondin 1. And for that, uh, we did a rescue experiment where we added thrombospondin 1 to the neuron organoid LFC co-culture. And we found that um, addition of thrombospondin 1 significantly increases the integration of low functional connectivity cells. As you can see here, now these LFC cells are behaving more like HFC cells and they're trying to co-localize with the functioning neurons. 
So this integrative phenotype of high functional connectivity regions was further validated by our patient derived xenograft model. For the PDX model, we um, xenografted RFP labeled glioma cells, high and low functional connectivity glioma cells into the CA1 region of mouse hippocampus. Um, several weeks after grafting, uh, we sacrificed mice. We took their brains out and did electron immunoelectron microscopy to look for synaptic structures. Uh, we then identified this uh, characteristic uh, neuron to glioma synapse at an increased frequency in our high functional connectivity xenografts compared to low. So if you look closely, this uh, neuron to glioma synapse uh, contains a presynaptic neuronal part with clustered synaptic vesicles and a postsynaptic glioma part, which is identified by this presence of uh, immunogold particles labeling RFP in the tumor cells. And uh, we also found that compared to LFC, as you see here, the total number of synapses was significantly higher in our HFC regions, uh, further confirming its integrative phenotype. And next, we wanted to know if this intratumoral connectivity, does this have any uh, clinical significance to the patient? Uh, we found that our patient's language performance, as determined by their auditory naming score, it declines with increase in the number of high functional connectivity image regions. We also looked at the survival statistics of these patients, and we found that patients with glioma patients with intratumoral high functional connectivity, which is marked in red here, they have a decline in their survival. They have a shorter overall survival compared to patients without intratumoral regions. So overall, um, this data shows that having a functionally integrated glioma can be a bad thing, and it can have negative consequences on the language performance and survival outcome of the patients. To sum up, uh, we found that synaptogenic glioma cells are localized within intratumoral regions with high functional connectivity, and glioma neuronal interactions, which is mediated by this uh, specific population of synaptogenic glioma cells, can support network integration at least in part through thrombospondin 1 paracrine signaling. Finally, and more importantly, um, glioma network integration, as determined by this presence of intratumoral high connectivity regions, can have a negative impact on uh, language processing and survival outcome of the patients. That's all from me. Thank you. I'm, I'm handing over back to Sean for the acknowledgement. Great job, Saritha. You, know, um, you have a couple of minutes left, so I don't want to cut into the question and answer session, but obviously I want to acknowledge everyone in the lab. Saritha has done an amazing job. Dr. Berger, um, my close friends and collaborators, um, Michelle and uh, Eddie, as well as uh, the Raleigh Lab and the David Brang Lab as well. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And Jenny, will answer any questions. Thank you, Sean and Sarita. That was, that was really great. I think one question that I inherently had is, is that looking at these differences between high and low connectivity tumors, is there any histiologic or molecular aspects that seem to be different among these tumors? For example, oligodendrogliomas versus astrocytomas or anything that seems inherently different that may help us predict uh, the recovery for some of these patients? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, I should specify, this study is really focused on IDH wild-type glioblastoma. Um, we believe so far, based on our in, in this experiment so far, that the IDH wild-type glioblast uh, IDH mutant glioblastoma story is probably very different. Um, and so uh, I won't go into that too much at this point, but uh, predominantly this story is IDH wild-type glioblastoma. That's very helpful. And we have a question from the audience. Um, could you comment on the genetic and epigenetic drivers of the TSP1 expression within your tumor population? Yeah, so again, man, just starting to scratch the surface on that. Um, so we actually had a, a lab meeting about that this past week. I don't know that I sh should answer that yet. We are really just uh, just starting to get into that. This TS, you know, TSP1 was interesting to us predominantly because it, this is a very normal physiologic um, uh, uh, protein uh, that's important for paracrine signaling for astrocytes in general. Uh, Carla Erlegu and some others have published quite a bit on um, astrocyte populations in TSP1. And so we, when we saw TSP1 and we didn't go in detail into the bulk and RNA single cell RNA sequencing experiments, but that really stood out to us. Um, there's probably an epigenetic factor here, um, but we're, again, we're just starting to, to delve into that. So I can't answer that yet. Hopefully next year, if we do this again, 
So I'll be able to answer that in much more detail. Good answer. Um, and then uh, one additional question is you proposed aphasia as a model for connectivity differences in, uh, and functional networks across the brain in general. And so could you speak how as a neurosurgeon you would anticipate being able to apply some of this information to other cognitive domains outside of language? Yeah, let me answer that a, a couple of different ways. So, you know, when, it, when I when we started the lab uh, uh, three years ago now, I really, really wanted to study large scale distributive networks, right? I wanted to understand really the processes that are, that, you know, Martin Klein and Jeff Weffel and everybody has been writing about for many, many years. And I'll, I'll tell you with each passing month, we actually, from a mechanistic standpoint, are actually working backwards. We're studying simpler and simpler neural circuits because the processes are just too complicated. Um, as a neurosurgeon, I say, um, I would want to be able to predict uh, neurologic impairment in our patients, right? If you make a decision on your extended resection goals, I would argue that the balance between uh, function and survival um, should be very individual. And if we have predictive modeling to understand that based on some of these factors, whether it's your ApoE allele, um, uh, whether it's the, your amount of secreted TSP1, whether it's HFC, whatever, within the tumor, et cetera, um, I, it, I think there will be a day when we have more nuanced discussion with our patients about um, what their risk profile is and what their recovery profile may look like. Um, and so again, as a neurosurgeon, I would almost certainly use that information to help guide goals of decision-making, particularly for patients with low-grade gliomas. Thank you so much. That was really um, a wonderful talk. Yeah.